Okay, so let's transition now to discuss some of the characters of the Americans. Now, I will not be talking about all of them because there are just so many of them to talk about. Uh, so I'm going to limit my discussion to a few of the main characters who have effectively stuck with us for the last six years of the program. Now, chiefly, I'm going to focus on Philip, Elizabeth, Paige, and Henry, the Jennings family, of course, Stan Beeman, the FBI agent, and Oleg Burov, our former KGB agent implanted into the Residentura uh, inside the United States. Now, what I'm going to look at is some of the impressions I had of these characters across the years, their relationships to one another, and where they ended up as the series went on, and finally drew to conclusion. Now, as we go, I'll also profile their associations with other auxiliary characters, though we will not be exploring all of these relationships in depth. Perhaps we'll save that for some other video. Let's get started then with Philip Jennings. When we first meet Philip, he is already demonstrating his skills as a well-trained and well-disciplined spy. He's on a mission to capture KGB defector Nikolai Timoshev and return him to the Soviet Union to face the wrath of his superiors at the center, the Moscow headquarters of the KGB at Lubyanka Square. Now, throughout the duration of this mission, Philip is using a variety of techniques that are inherent to spycraft. He's using disguises, uh, he's making drops, and he's even using his training in infiltration to gain vital information from inside the Federal Bureau of Investigation through the personage of FBI Secretary Martha Hansen. Philip is also engaged in a separate but even more vital mission to plant a microphone inside the home of Caspar Weinberger, Secretary of Defense during the Reagan administration. Now, to achieve this, both he and Elizabeth take upon themselves an elaborate plot to poison the son of the Weinberger's housekeeper, one Viola Johnson. In the process of this operation, Philip threatens to kill Viola's son, a young man by the name of Grayson, when she refuses to cooperate. He actually smothers Grayson until Viola relents and promises her unadulterated cooperation in planting the microphone inside the Weinberger's home. So we see from these things that Philip is more than able to carry out his missions with deft determination using whatever means are necessary, including murder, to accomplish the task. But what we also see is that Philip is very reluctant to undertake such measures, especially against the innocent. And this is something that I believe provides a great deal of contrast between himself and Elizabeth, something that I will return to when we get back to Elizabeth in her own profile. Simultaneously, what we also observe in these very first opening episodes is a Philip Jennings who, from episode one, really, is already trying to persuade Elizabeth to defect to the United States. And this is where we get into what can be considered the main thesis, if you will, of Philip Jennings. One which I think separates him from Elizabeth in a big way, and one that is very consistent throughout the series. From episode one, Philip has always shown himself capable of seeing the humanity of his enemies, of seeing that America is not this big bad force in the world that Soviet propaganda makes it out to be, and that the American people themselves are not as weak, decadent, or directionless as Elizabeth seems to think they are. And while Philip is certainly dedicated to his mother country, he can also see its flaws much more than Elizabeth is able to, and he's far more willing to question the KGB's orders than she is. This leads him on multiple occasions throughout the series to have a crisis of conscience when it comes to executing his missions, particularly when it comes to killing those not directly opposed to Soviet goals. He often expresses open guilt to Elizabeth or quiet remorse to himself about having done so, and eventually this reluctance leads him to resign from active missions altogether. Simultaneously, he and Elizabeth constantly battle about their children. Philip is very comfortable with both Paige and Henry being all-American kids, with them never knowing a single thing about what he and Elizabeth do and who they really are. He wants them to be able to live their lives free to make their own choices without the burden of being hindered psychologically or otherwise by the knowledge that their parents are anything but decent, hard-working, everyday Americans. Now, of course, as the series goes on, this hope is eventually shattered, at least in the case of Paige, who does later on discover what her parents are actually part of. With respect to Philip's relationship to Stan Beeman, 
the FBI agent, we observe a very complex but genuine friendship that evolves over time. At first, Philip sees Stan as nothing more than a threat whom he treats accordingly and whom he examines for any professional vulnerabilities he can exploit or any personal weaknesses he can use against Stan. However, as the series goes on, Philip and Stan create an abiding and real friendship that is rooted in their shared struggles with their spouses, with their children, with their professional obligations, and even as men navigating the world. And these struggles lead both men and both families to draw closer to one another over time, so much so that Stan actually forgets that he once had a gut suspicion that something was off about the Jennings family. And it leads Philip to allow himself to be more open and vulnerable with Stan, even though he never let Stan know until the very end of the series that in reality, he's a Russian spy. There are four women who might be considered Philip's chickadees throughout the life of the series. Now, I don't mean in the sense that they were his side pieces, as the modern saying goes, that he was having some kind of tantalizing extramarital affairs with. I mean in the sense that he was working them as a Soviet spy. They are Martha Hansen, Annalise, Kimberly Breland, and Irina Simonova. Now let's discuss Philip's relationship to each one of these girls in turn because his association with each one of them becomes pivotal to his development as a character throughout the Americans' continuing storyline. We'll start with the darling Martha Hansen. I didn't call Martha darling without reason. In many ways, she is in fact a very adoring and loving person, extremely trusting, open, and desperately wanting to have a connection with another human being. In fact, the late Frank Gadd once called her a quote, good girl, unquote, referring to her work ethic, commitment to the FBI, patriotism, and her warmth toward her coworkers. In many ways, Martha is very much an all-American woman, but in other ways, these same positive qualities often serve to make her vulnerable to deception and naive to the subtler machinations of counter-espionage. And it is through these weaknesses that Philip inveigles his way into her life, posing as a high-level government intelligence functionary conducting security screens on her FBI office. He acquires Martha's cooperation through standard techniques of psychological and physical seduction, demonstrating his absolute mastery over the art of sexpionage, even going as far as to marry Martha in a staged ceremony designed to gain her ultimate trust. He sets up a false married life with her and begins playing house, doing his ever best to keep the ruse alive, all while pumping her for information from inside the FBI. Now this continues until Martha starts growing more and more suspicious of Philip's frequent absences from their new family home, and it reaches a climax when Martha's maternal instincts kick in and she tells her new husband that she wants to have a baby. Philip's reluctance to even entertain this idea perplexes Martha, and it deepens her suspicion of him and the many questions she has about his background. After all, most people who get married naturally want to extend their family line through children. The fact that Philip, aka Clark Westerfeld, makes so many adamant excuses as to why he and Martha should not doesn't sit well with her at all. This and other illogical events culminate in Martha no longer trusting Philip, even as her enigmatic husband, and she confronts him, ultimately forcing Philip to decide if he will reveal the truth to her or not. He does so, and this sets off a string of occurrences that end with Martha betraying the FBI, her closest colleagues, her family, and country, and finally having to be repatriated to Russia, from which she will, most likely, never be able to return home again. These incidents force Philip into a deeper introspection regarding his career, the path of deceit that he's chosen, and the broken human lives that he's left behind as a consequence. This included the possibility of liquidating Martha, i.e. killing her, if she chose not to be exfiltrated to Russia. It was an offhand alternative first proposed by Elizabeth, and while Philip understood this action as a means to protect his identity from an operational point of view, it was a verdict he ultimately rejected as being unjustified against a woman whose only crime in this case was acting against her country, not out of ideology or greed or hubris, but in the name of love. But it is through the summation of these matters that Philip once more proves himself to be a man not of cynical or cold-blooded calculation, 
but a person of deep feeling, conscience, and humanity, despite all his training and years as a KGB officer. And this is but one more cog in the wheel that forces him to reevaluate his standing with not only his country and its intelligence service, but also with his wife. Representing himself as the Swedish intelligence officer Scott Birkeland, Philip enters the world of Annalise, the socialite wife of the Deputy Undersecretary of Defense. Now, we never find out Annalise's last name, but what we do know of her shows that if Martha Hansen is the good girl among Philip's women, then Annalise is without a doubt the opposite of the bunch. She's extremely self-absorbed, narcissistic, self-centered, vain, and even a bit arrogant. All qualities that allow Philip to emotionally and psychologically manipulate her to gain vital information from an agent of Pakistani intelligence, whom Philip has her working. They are also qualities that ultimately bring her life to an unnatural end and cause her to get fitted for a suitcase. Now what is interesting about Annalise is how her death affects Philip. He'd been working her for three years prior to her first appearance, using the standard sex espionage techniques, apparently though with few results to show for it. However, when the stakes are upped, and Philip ups the requirements also, Annalise's more unstable personality manifests itself, and showing how unfit she really is for spycraft, she makes a separate set of demands on Philip and her ISI lover, which neither can realistically fulfill. And in an act of self-aggrandizement meant to show her Pakistani lover boy just how important she is, she admits the truth of using him for information that she's been feeding to Philip. Her lover panics and murders her while Philip, unsure of what's happening at first, sits in an adjoining hotel room and listens. When he finally does realize what's occurring, he bursts into the room, but too late to save the now-dead Honeypot's life. Externally, Philip uses Annalise's death to continue manipulating the target of the honey trap, but internally, her murder haunts him, and he vociferously complains to Gabriel and Elizabeth that he had said for years that Annalise was too unstable and not cut out for this kind of work. He blames himself and others for the loss causing doubt in his capability to do his job. Now chronologically, Annalise is the first example of Philip's misgivings about what his life as a KGB officer means for those less fortunate souls who run afoul of his work, but she certainly is not the last, and perhaps not even the most significant. But like the others, her life does impact his, and her death impacts it far more. Let's turn our attention now to Philip's former girlfriend of his youth, Irina Semenova. In short, Irina is the woman whom Philip left behind in Russia when he first joined the KGB back in the 1960s. Unknown to him, she also chose to join the KGB and serve her country. And also unknown to him, she was pregnant with his actual firstborn child at the time of his departure. When they are reunited 20 some odd years later on a joint operation for the KGB, it is only then that Philip learns he has a son with Irina, who is his namesake. At this point, the two begin a brief rekindling of their past love affair, which causes both to question their commitment to KGB objectives and the life of lies they are forced to live. Citing her disdain for the operation they're currently engaged in and its impact upon her dead but speedily resurrecting conscience, Irina begs Philip to abandon his loyalty to the KGB, forget everything else, including his false family, and run away with her. This puts Philip in a quandary, for though he still loves Irina deeply, he also loves Elizabeth and their children. Abandoning them, even for Irina and the possibility of seeing his firstborn son, is not only impractical to Philip, it is morally objectionable. This sense of moral responsibility is quite astonishing from someone who lives their entire life in a state of amoral practicality, but it is exactly the kind of action that defines Philip Jennings and gives him yet more rationale to reject his career and the lifestyle it creates. When Philip later learns that the KGB caught up to Irina and presumably killed her after her defection from the organization, one more cog in the wheel was placed for his ultimate early resignation from active duty. Undoubtedly the youngest and probably most naive of all Philip's girls is the 15-year-old Kimberly Breland. She is the daughter of CIA agent Isaac Breland, who poses as a member of the U.S. Department of Agriculture, but in reality is head of the agency's Afghanistan intelligence desk. Philip is tasked to find a means of acquiring information on the CIA's activities through this section, 
and in the process befriends the young Kimmy, as she is nicknamed. Because Kimberly's birth mother is dead, her older siblings already out of the family home, and her father and stepmother largely absent due to their work, she is a lonely young girl, desperately in need of attention and affection. It can be essentially said that Kimberly has daddy issues. Philip uses this emotional vulnerability, posing as the bad boy lawyer Jim, an older man whom Kimberly goes for almost immediately because of his life experience and joie de vivre. At the same time, Kimberly is also attracted to Jim's own perceived vulnerability, and Philip uses this infatuation to gain access to Kimberly's father's office and plant a listening device inside his briefcase from which inside information on CIA Afghani intelligence will be obtained. But what is relevant to Philip's relationship to Kimmy is how her obsession with older men plays upon him psychologically and emotionally. Philip is very reluctant to involve himself in any way but the most necessary in Kimmy's life, even though eventually she desires to take things further, including beginning a sexual relationship with him. She offers herself to Philip, but he refuses, finding very creative but convincing reasons why it is not possible for them to be together physically. Philip argues his reservations about using Kimmy in this way to both Elizabeth and their handler Gabriel, and both try to further persuade Philip that he should sexually engage Kimberly if it means keeping access to the Afghan intel. Elizabeth particularly tries to encourage Philip to press forward in this manner, even going as far with time to convince Philip that Kimberly is not a child, at least not anymore, and that he should treat her like the adult she wants to be. To maintain the Breland intelligence, Philip eventually does have sex with Kimmy, but regrets it even in the middle of the act. The relationship culminates after a few years, when Philip is tasked to convince Kimmy to take a vacation in the communist nation so that she can be kidnapped, and her father blackmailed into working for the KGB to secure her safe return. Philip's conscience finally wrestles him into submission, and he tells Kimberly she is not to go to any communist country under any circumstances, no matter how much someone may try to convince her otherwise. He abruptly ends the relationship on this sudden note, and never contacts her again. Now what we observe in all these examples is not a KGB agent who simply resists using his skills to manipulate and deceive women just because he doesn't want to. He's done that many times to many women. Instead, what we observe is a man whose chosen profession has begun to get the best of him after 20 years on the job, and who, because of everything he's done and seen, is reaching a breaking point that cannot be long sustained. Now, this is particularly true when the objectives don't justify the means used to obtain them, nor the harm caused to innocent people in their wake. Martha, Kimberly, Irina, and Annalise each represent this realization to Philip in their own separate ways. Be like